and welcome to Finextra. I'm Hannah Wallace, and joining me now is Philip Tolliver, Head of Strategy for Amir and APEC of Boardridge, and we're discussing the impact of regulation and Brexit on the capital market firms. Philip, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Now, there's no doubt that the capital market firms are having to keep up with the evolving regulatory and geopolitical landscape. In light of this, what do you think are the main pressures for firms? The overwhelming factor in the industry is, is ROE. Um, and that's been true ever since the financial crisis and the heavy regulatory pressure uh, that's been put on uh, banks' balance sheet performance. That has actually um, gone through a moderate period of improvement over the last few years, the last two or three years, where we're finally seeing ROE uh, roughly equal to cost of capital at 10%. That's, of course, masking very important regional differences, namely that the American banks are performing significantly better than their European counterparts. Looking ahead, I would say, um, you know, you're going to see a, a period of continued very slow improvement, driven in part by um, optimization of the trading book, driven in part by a slight easing of regulations, um, driven by uh, operational improvements. However, there's a period of more absorption of change coming up, um, including a number of operational regulations, and there's really an opportunity now to harvest the benefits of new emerging technologies, um, and we think that's really creating both an opportunity and a risk for banks at the moment. Now let's talk more about regulation. What regulatory obligations are you seeing impacting firms the most, and what strategies are they implementing to overcome business and operational challenges? Sure, so I think um, you know, historically what we were looking at was a lot of regulations related to performance of the balance sheet. So Basel, uh, Federal Reserve stress testing, Dodd-Frank, et cetera. We're now going, looking at are really regulations that relate to um, operational performance of the business and how the business works, protects information, reports information, et cetera. So most noteworthy of late, uh, MIFID II, which went into effect back in January, that was really, um, to be honest, at the end of very much a last minute scramble. So there's a lot of day two work going on to industrialize what was done in the past. Mm -hmm. Similar story with GDPR, which just went into effect a few weeks ago. And in that case, GDPR, again, a lot of work left to do to sort of industrialize what was, what was cobbled together to meet the regulatory deadlines. An extension of the MIFID II regulation related to trade reporting um, is for, is a, uh, SFTR, which is specific to securities financing transactions, and that will be going into effect in a year. Still a lot of work left to be done to implement that. Um, we also have uh, upcoming regulations related to the way securities depositories work, called CSDR, um, and that'll really change settlement practices throughout Europe. Um, and then I think everyone is concerned about Brexit. So um, what is going to happen with Brexit? What is the expectation in terms of hard versus soft Brexit? And that's driving a lot of uh, scenario-based decision-making on behalf of the banks who, uh, who Broadridge serves. Building on Brexit, I think there's a lot of um, open questions about how banks are planning for the future. So most noteworthy is some of the passporting rules, the, the fate of euro clearing and where that will be um, operating from. Um, and then along with that, a lot of uh, decisions to make about domicile, legal entity structure, and of course, where talent is, where is talent based, and the access to um, the personnel that are critical for the operation of a successful financial market in, in Europe. And finally, Philip, what opportunities are you seeing presented in this disrupted marketplace? And what can firms do to take advantage of them? So I think it's important to tie this back to um, the ROE discussion. Firstly, that although this is improved, um, you know, it's all about making sure that you keep in front of the rest of the industry from a, a business performance perspective. So there's a lot of interesting conversations about uh, distributed ledger and robotics and cloud, and those are all very exciting technologies and there's a huge amount of opportunity there. But it's also important to know that there's real near-term savings opportunities that, frankly, investors will expect banks to deliver. And so what I'm really talking about here is opportunities to mutualize some of the more routinized um, functions such as trade expense management, tax, um, securities financing, uh, post-trade, et cetera. They're real opportunities to glean savings in the near term. 
I think also important in how it relates to disruptive technology is that adoption of some of those um, partnerships with third parties, specifically around the functions I described, provides a meaningful on-ramp and real use cases relating to how to ad adopt disruptive technologies in the future. Partnering with these with providers creates a real meaningful opportunity for savings in the near term, but more importantly as it pertains to adoption of new technologies and disruption, provides an opportunity to pool resources, to co-invest, and to provide real tangible use cases that accelerate adoption of things like distributed ledger, machine learning, and cloud. Philip, this has been great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for watching.